Are we alone? I don't think that I could easily give an answer to that question without uh, delving a bit more into what we mean by we. And okay, what do we mean by we? Uh, so I think usually when people ask that question, uh, especially, I suppose, if they're casting their eyes towards the stars and they're thinking about humanity uh, and imagining uh, that there could be other species that seem to us to be more like us uh, than the animals or plants that we find here on Earth. You know, we have all these examples of life on Earth. There are things that we think of as being very distinctive of humanness uh, that contrast us with other living things. Uh, and you know, you could point to language and writing or technology or what have you that we feel like we're really good at. Uh, and uh, it's possible for us to imagine that there might be things in the world that are not people that might be good at those things. Uh, so functionally equivalent humans, to use yeah, Carl so Sagan's Yeah, I, so I, I think that when people ask that question, that's what they mean. Or, you know, they could be asking something else. Um, they could be asking a more sort of existential question or a theological question. So, I, you know, you need to guide, okay. guide me okay. towards what All kind right. of a... Well, when you, have you thought about this question? Um, in, in one form or another, I mean, I think... In what form? So, I, I think I've been asked before whether I think there is what's called intelligent life on other planets. Um, and I think I've been asked that because some of my own research has touched on the question of how some kinds of distinctively lifelike behaviors might be able to get going in initially naive physical settings that don't seem to have anything lifelike going on in them. Um, and, and that does, I think, provoke people to think about the question of sort of what might happen far away uh, on another planet. And I, I tend to be pretty evasive in the kind of answers that I give to those questions because I think that a really important thing that we need to do before we could hope to start answering a question like that uh, is define better what we would be impressed by, so to speak. What would constitute a uh, successful uh, example of being like human beings in the ways that we think that we're special. Okay, let's forget that animals. question. Okay, let's forget sorry. that question. And let's just talk about something more closely related to your research, sure. and that is, are we alone in the sense of, is the life on Earth the only life in the universe? So, I think that viewing this from the perspective of physics, which is my um, vocation, uh, I like to start by pointing out that when we do science, we can actually be speaking different languages uh, while we're doing it. And it's good for us to be aware of that. So for example, if I'm a biologist, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by taking the phenomenon of life for granted, and then you know, getting a collection of things that are alive, you know, cells and plants and people and what have you, uh, and then starting to do scientific research on what keeps them alive, what makes them die, what keeps them healthy, those kinds of things. Physics, on the other hand, orients itself towards very different approaches to describing and categorizing the basic features of the world. So you're talking about distance and time uh, and quantification of a material, you know, all these basic numbers that you can measure out of the world and looking for predictable relationships between them. So it's possible to come to a living thing now and say, what are the physical properties of this living thing? And not only that, but are there relationships as we expect there should be between some of those physical properties and whether they're able to remain alive. But I always like to point out, you know, I could take a cat and throw it out the window of my office and I could measure how fast it was moving when it hits the ground, or I could see whether it's alive afterwards. And while it might be the case that how fast the cat is moving when it hits the ground is clearly quite important to the question of whether it survives the ordeal, it will never be the case that measuring how fast something is moving is the same thing as asking whether it's alive or dead. We're talking okay. about two different ways of describing the same system. Right. And there's an intuitive act that is required to translate between them. Right, but there's one question. The question is, do you think that we're alone in the universe where we is we the life forms on Earth? Right, but so I, all of that preface, the reason I, I provide it is because I think what that means is that whether we find life elsewhere is very much a question of our choice in how to uh, define that phenomenon, right? And if we're looking for it uh, in uh, terms that are 
principally rooted in the examples we see in the life that we know. So we're saying, you know, can we find things that have DNA or can we find things that have mitochondria or whatever? Uh, we would uh, probably give one kind of answer that might be, you know, sound a bit harsher. It might be, you know, harder to imagine or expect that we'd necessarily be able to find other things like that. Uh, if we're looking at it in terms of physical properties and we're saying instead, uh, are there things out there in the world that could be demonstrated to, for example, uh, be very finely tuned to their surrounding environment in such a way that they are very good at harvesting energy from a source that it's har difficult to harvest energy from? Or uh, are there things out there uh, in the universe that are not here on Earth that could demonstrably uh, be instantiating what look to us like complex predictive computations of the predictable part of their surroundings, uh, then it might be the case that the answer to that could turn out to be yes, but it might also be the case that in a sense, when we found such examples, maybe we'd be disappointed because what we're really hoping for is things with you know five fingers that are maybe a little taller and green and fly in saucers or something like that. Uh, but if instead what we found, for example, was that you know, turbulence as a phenomenon uh, turns out to have more complex computation going on in it than we initially realized if you look at it through the right lens and measure the right things and, and track the right relationships in it. You know, that could be, it turn out to be the case, and I'm not claiming it is, but suppose it turned out to be the case that that was true uh, of turbulent fluids here on Earth. Well, then it might all the more so be true of other kinds of turbulent fluids elsewhere in the world, well, in I've, the universe. Well, I've written a paper saying we haven't found extraterrestrials or, or we haven't found ET, or have we? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if far from equilibrium dissipative systems can be defined as life forms, then mm -hmm. we've already found them on Earth and all over the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that what you're talking about? Well, I, I guess I'm not really looking to move the marker in terms of the definition of life at some level. I think that you know we knew what to call life long before people knew uh, a lot of physics, and then, you know, there was a sort of a, a, a linguistic convention that developed to say trees are alive and rocks are not alive. And viruses? Uh, uh, well, so there always are going to be corner cases, but... Uh, always going to be what? There always are going to be corner cases. Corner but, cases. Or borderline cases, but... Border I, so there's are you an sure actually, that's not the heart of the issue? Well, I, I think that um, the existence of a borderline between categories does not make it difficult for us to point to examples that are clearly very far from the line. And it, if the majority of members of the set are far from the line, then the category is a, a well-defined thing, I think, even if there are some border the cases. The majority are exactly on the line because there are more viruses than anything else. Well, uh, I agree with you that it depends on how we sort of uh, draw the borders in our set. I mean, it's true that uh, there's great diversity in the viral world. So if I'm counting by, I don't know, uh, genomes that are distinct by a certain amount of homology, then yes, you know, there might be a lot more viruses. Uh, blue whales are, in another sense, more impressive to me than viruses because they're really, really big. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that it all depends on your criterion. Right, well, uh, that's my next question. How about Gaia? How about the idea that the biosphere is alive? There are things bigger than blue whales. They're called ecosystems or biospheres. What about those things and being alive? Well, so I think that's a, a very important and interesting point um, because what it partly draws out is that to some degree this is even uh, an ideological question, right? And if we look far in the past, there are lots of people who inclined towards wanting to treat, you know, I don't know, rivers or winds uh, or, or the earth as a whole as, as being some kind of uh, living or conscious being. And I think rather than dismissing that as idiotic, I think what we should rather realize is that the Turing test uh, should not necessarily be thought of something as, as being so difficult to pass depending on the inclination of the individual to find uh, some kind of counterpart there, right? So if someone really wants to believe that they're talking to the wind, then it may not be so wait, difficult wait, 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 for them I'm confused. to... The Turing test has to do with uh, intelligence. Right. And we're talking about life here. Okay. So, well, I the, confounded them in a way that I'm, I'm not used to. Well, I guess maybe the reason I, I got driven there is because um, if we're just talking about uh, the Earth as being alive, then I, I think since the Earth is made of stuff that's alive, it's very strange to say, well, it's, it's made 
in large part, or I don't know, I shouldn't say by mass, but there's a huge amount of living stuff on Earth. Well, to say that the Earth is not alive, even though there's a lot of living stuff in it, then I don't even know how we're using the word. I mean, of course it's partly composed of living things. But so now I think in, in the way you're posing your question, the question is, it, is, is the Earth one cohesive organism in no, some no, sense? No, or no, so, so no. Well, are you a cohesive organism? You have hair that's kind of part of you and fingernails are part of you and you breathe out CO2 that's kind sure, of part of you. Sure. But in, in other words, all system, life systems are open. And if so, they're open, then some of them are more open than others. But, but I, I think I, I tend to give very unsatisfying answers about this because I think the point is that we are in the driver's seat. We make choices about how to take the world and slice it into different pieces and uh -huh. decide where the borders are. So there's a great quotation by uh, the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein that I like very much, which is, uh, the borders of my language are the borders of my world. You, know, you take the same phenomenology of experience and you have a... A procedure of classification that you can develop, but there are different ways of talking about the same thing, and you sort of slice up the pie however you want. So, a physicist could look at me and say, "Oh, well, you're made of you know these particles that have these charges, and they stick together in these bound states, uh, and really the, your surroundings are made of the same particles, and I don't recognize a natural physical boundary in the most basic, you know, subatomic particle sense between what you are and and what something else is." But, you know, except maybe there's like slightly higher particle density here than there is out here. Maybe we could draw a line there. Um, but obviously there's another sense in which there's a very clear way in which I'm a separate organism from the air around me. And, and I, I don't think we should be looking for a basic and fundamental physical description to tell us where those lines are. I think that actually we have the inclination to draw those lines in certain places. And uh, it's, it's very much often about uh, a common agreement among people where they want to draw those lines. So someone else, I, I said earlier that rocks are not alive. Someone else might have said, no, if you, if you watch the Earth for a billion years and you watch the rocks flow around, it's a dynamic non-equilibrium system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has features that you know, we can point to that actually are uh, surprisingly parallel to those of uh, living things that we study at the molecular level. Uh, but I don't use the word alive that way because that hasn't been the way uh, that I've, I've been taught to use it up until this point. And I, I don't think the point here is to try to uh, change the meanings of words. Uh, but what we can do is we can say, let's look at living things as physicists. Let's think about what are the distinctive features of living things in terms of their physical properties. Not necessarily unique, but distinctive. So living things are better at doing certain things than others. Rocks and cats both fall in gravity, but cats are better self-replicators than rocks, right, let's say. So you know, if we focus in on self-replication, we can study the physics of self-replication, and we can learn things about how feasible it is, according to physical laws that we assume to be valid, to uh, realize self-replication in one context or another context. And that won't necessarily tell us what's alive and what's not, but it might tell us, if we're interested to know, where self-replication can happen and where it can't. And since that's the bread and butter of how you get things that re remind us of life, then it's probably an important thing to think about. Well, I, I interviewed Jack Sostak, and, and I just mm -hmm. became aware of a 2012 article that he wrote called, Attempts to Define Life Do Not Help to Understand the Origin of Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess, uh, is that, do you agree, would you agree with that? That sounds like a, a reasonable statement to me. I, like I said, I, I think that even if we try to be very uh, sort of by the book and uh, middle brow in some sense in what we say is alive, so you, know, you, you ask uh, a child of the age of 10 or 11 what's alive and what's not, they have a very good sense of that already. And there are border cases, viruses, et cetera, whatever. Uh, but I don't think that that ends up being, to me, the really interesting issue. I think that what we have to do instead is analyze what it is about the good examples of living things that we find the most distinctive and the most impressive. And the more that we can break that into different features, like I said before, self-replication, energy harvesting, predictive computation, you know, behaving uh, in certain ways that we don't feel that things that we usually call not alive are necessarily good at, the more we can start 
looking for those behaviors and, and understanding how to detect them. Um, and the thing that I think is really important for us to recognize is that once we look at it that way, there may be a lot more of it to detect here on Earth uh, than we have already realized is there because we may not be looking at some of the things that we call not alive in the right way. Uh, but if we have the right physical tools and the right sort of theoretical frame to bring onto things, uh, then we might be able to see a lot more of that in our more immediate surroundings. And the more so we, I think, are capable of that, the more that will change how we view the possibility of what could be out uh, far beyond the reaches of Earth. Okay, so the question, are we alive? Your answer is? Are people? Oh, no, I'm sorry, not are we alive. I'm sorry, are we alone? <laughs> are, you are alive, right? Uh, I, I uh, am quite confident that I'm alive. Okay. Thank and, God. And there's a plant behind you. Mm -hmm. That presumably is alive. Is there anything else alive in this room besides me? Um, well, so I assume that there are bacteria uh, in this room, which uh, we could culture and uh, study with microscopes. And should we do so, I think we'd be quite convinced that they're alive. And viruses? Um, I just... You just don't like it. I, don't, I just don't feel the need to draw the line one way or another. They clearly are less like uh, a blue whale than I am. Um, and they clearly are more like living things than sand. Uh, they have recognizable features that um, uh, are, are very much in common with the things that are unquestionably alive. I mean, wow. viruses have genomes, right? So if you have so, a genome, maybe you're alive. <laughs> Someone wants to draw the line there. But if we don't, then that's well, okay. How about genes? Are genes alive? Selfish uh, genes. Uh, Lynn Margulis would say you can't. Genes can't be selfish because they're not alive. They, because she was a, I say, think she subscribed to. It's got to have a cell membrane. It's got to be isolated. And yet genes are not necessarily isolated, and so they can't be selfish. Therefore, they can't be alive. What's yeah, your take I, on that issue? I, I suppose that if I am shooting from the hip, I would say genes on their own are not alive. Um, but that's really just trying to generalize from again the best examples of what's alive that I can think of. Okay. Um, Do you think, uh, does life need a liquid? Um, so what I would say about that is, if I'm now thinking about the physics of distinctively lifelike behaviors, you know, if we're going to try to see one of those things happening, then empirically and, and based on some of what we've been able to find in simulations that we've been doing and you know, analytical, theoretical work that we've been trying to do, I think you need a few different ingredients. One is, one is that you need to be far from thermal equilibrium, uh, and that's one that's been appreciated for a long time, and what that means is basically... Wait, thermal or any type of equilibrium? Because there's chemical equilibrium and there's like gravitational equilibrium. Well, so I'm, I'm using this concept. What I mean is, I, I should say far from statistical equilibrium, uh, which hopefully is you know, a, a broader concept once we're talking about gravity, I opt out. I, I, I think that when we're talking about things on scales where gravity matters, my understanding is that some of the things that we can talk about in terms of statistical mechanics become fraught issues because of technical issues having to do with extensivity and system size and with, with range of interaction. Extensivity. Yeah, like range of interaction, things that are you know um, not worth getting into right now. So I'm not going to talk about those kinds of link scales. I mean, then you, when you're talking about cosmological ones, it, it gets even crazier because then we're talking about things, you know, uh, Hubble expansion and a lot of other stuff that makes StatMec very confusing. So if I can just root myself in, in my safe plot where, you know, uh, I can think about a big system with lots of particles, they're sharing around energy, they're binding together and combining in different ways. So some kind of chemical or thermal equilibrium or statistical equilibrium in such a setting, the things that we think of as being alive uh, are uh, prohibitively unlikely in a, in a large system of that kind uh, because the things that are distinctively lifelike tend to involve uh, behaviors that look like they're breaking the right. reversal symmetry of time. So how do you uh, explain the origin of life then? Uh, well, so uh, I, I think that in an ultimate sense, uh, people, when they ask that question, uh, maybe want to talk about it in cosmological terms. And as I said, I've opted out of that. Uh, 
And what that means is I get to take for granted that I have a star and there's you know light coming out of it right. and it can be bombarding a planet. And so I have an open system already. I have, have an them. out of equilibrium flow right, that right. can be powered right. by solar energy, yeah. by geothermal energy, something like that. Presumably that's all um, over the universe because we've detected right. all so kinds that, of planets. That you should be able to find all right. over the place. So based right? on your research, how given all that, based on the research you do, yeah. How likely is it for life to evolve elsewhere? So, so then I think there are some other distinctively life-like behaviors that you know are well. So, being out of equilibrium is a sine qua non. You need that, but it's not sufficient. You, there are lots of non-equilibrium systems that I think are disappointingly not life-like. So, I could take a jar of sand and I could shake it violently, um, and it might be that, as best we can tell, depending on how I'm shaking it to a first approximation, what I've effectively done is just kind of raised an effective temperature for the system. So everything's still kind of quasi-randomly bouncing around, but now it's doing so much more rapidly and violently than it would have at room temperature, right? So that's not going to get you something that you would call lifelike, because it still looks like something that's at thermal equilibrium, but just at a higher temperature. Right, but how about, or how about uh, convection zones? Right, and, right. And, so uh, then once, once you start to have you know, clear what's called detailed balance breaking, where you have these sort of cyclical flows of things, and you're far from equilibrium. I don't. I don't want to call that life yet because uh, it's uh, it's not obvious that this is sufficiently impressive to be life. If I just have a convection cell, there's a circular flow of something. Uh, but if that's all it's doing, then it's still a pretty simple thing. Not but it's also very unlikely, though, uh, from a statistical point of view. Unlikely at thermal equilibrium. Yeah. But once you take for granted that it's an open system, it's very easy to get those kinds of flows going. Okay. Um, but, but what I do think is that um, there are systems where what you can demonstrate is um, that, so they have what I would call a kind of combinatorial diversity. They have many components that can combine in ways that have a, a chemical diversity that leads to qualitatively different physical properties, right? So if I think about a living thing, what's very important about, say, me, if I think of myself in physical chemical terms is I'm made of presumably carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, et cetera. And so also is the plant behind me. Uh, and what makes us different is just that those building blocks are put together in different ways. That's the physical chemical idea of how to understand the way living things works, work. Um, and if you, if you work from that premise, uh, then, then the point is that you should be always interested when thinking about this question about what are the possible building blocks What's the diversity of number of ways they can combine? And not only that, but is there an external drive in this open system that's going to keep things away from thermal equilibrium in a way that matters to that chemical diversity? So what I mean is... Why, why are you say, saying thermal equilibrium? Because as I always sorry, say, I'm, I'm redox, just, redox could potential is what drives life. So I wouldn't call it a thermal I, I equilibrium. Am, I'm being, I mean thermal chemical statistical. I'm using those interchangeably. Okay. So, you know... Okay. Um, but, uh, so, if I have a system where there is a source of energy, let's say, in the environment, where the shape of the system itself, the way that those building blocks are put together, makes a significant difference, it makes a significant difference to how that structure interacts with that external environment, mm -hmm. I think that's a very important ingredient to the question of whether I can expect to see something interesting in, this, in a lifelike sense happen in, in that world. Because uh, what, what that means now is that not all parts of the what's called the phase space of this collection of matter are created equal, right? That there are lots of different ways of putting these building blocks together, but if a very tiny subset of those is capable, for example, of getting strongly pushed on by the environment because of the structure of the environment or the, the the particular features of the energy source in the environment. Uh, and this happens a lot in chemistry. Uh, for example, you know, if I have a bacterium and there's some sugar out here and it has the enzymes to eat the sugar, then I have an open system with an external drive and I can do lots of non-equilibrium things. But if there's no sugar in the environment that the bacterium can eat, then, you know, the Or there's all, sugar and no yeah, enzyme. Right, right exactly. If, there, if there's a sugar that is there but is inedible, then it may as well not be there and, and then you don't have an out of equilibrium chemical flux. So what that's pointing to is that the structure of the system um, in some cases can exhibit a very fine tuned matching to the structure of the environment. That happens in cases of dynamical and mechanical resonance. That happens in cases of uh, chemical catalysis. 
and you know, a, a diversity of, of examples. If you don't have a system that has those properties, then I think it's hard to argue uh, that you're going to be interested in the result uh, when you let things be far from equilibrium for a long time. Because what we're actually recognizing in the specialness of the architecture of life is a kind of fine tuning. We're saying, I, I, I understand intuitively that if I randomly rearrange the constituent parts, I'm not going to get something that is good at picking a banana off the tree or doing photosynthesis or, or the other things that right, involve This sounds like Fred Hoyle's argument, but you mm -hmm. don't get a, a 747 by blowing up the junkyard. But, but uh, Well, but what I'm saying is you, you might be able to get something like that by letting these components sit in that environment for a while, and that's the, that, that's the question. Well, but what, I'm, what I'm, I'm saying more, more primarily is that as a precondition to even the possibility of recognizing something that we would say has a lifelike feature, that's actually already a special condition on the types of ingredients that you have and the type of environment that you have. Because uh, it's not always the case that an environment that you present to a system is difficult to absorb energy from, uh, such that you'd be able to recognize the fine-tunedness of the structure that you, forms you in the system. Absorb, and so, uh, not extract, the same thing? Well, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking loosely, and it's hard without you know, talking about a more specific scenario. But so for example, you know, we've done um, simulations uh, of a randomly coupled chemical network. Uh, this is a paper that's actually uh, going to be coming out in PNAS soon, um, uh, which uh, is uh, in an external environment where what you do is you, because you're doing this in simulation, you have a lot of control over the laws of physics in this simulated world. You make it so that chemical reactions in this network are not strongly forced by the environment, except when the chemicals are in a very rare combination of composition. So I have a set of atoms that could combine in different ways, but I only make certain rare subsets of chemical combinations, ones that can be strongly forced. And then you just let the system explore its whole chemical space for a while. And the point is that eventually, given enough time, it reaches some state where it's kinetically stable, that it hangs out in that chemical region of chemical space for a while. And if you look at those regions of chemical space, they're not randomly chosen from the whole chemical space. They actually have a tendency to be enriched uh, in terms of certain thermodynamic properties that basically they either are highly inert with respect to their environment, so they sort of have been knocked around until they sort of turn sideways and the environment disappears and they don't get pushed around anymore, or they're highly forced, meaning that they found an arrangement that happens to be just in this right rare, in, in, in this rare shape where the environment is doing strong forcing uh, on the chemical reactions that are happening. So it's sort of like gaining access to a sugar in your environment. Does that mean that um, it's also producing entropy at a maximum rate? It's not producing entropy at a maximum rate. What it's doing is, in this case, um, a per reaction uh, causing a larger amount of entropy production uh, than uh, would be found from a random arrangement of the same building blocks. I think one of the things, well, we always like to talk about maximum and minimum, but one of the really difficult things with evolutionary systems is that they are always just remembering where they've been a short time earlier, um, and also uh, partly uh, determined in how they behave by what, what you might call kinetic factors of just the question of how fast certain things happen. So I can have a glass of water on a table, and I can do tons of entropy production by doing nuclear fusion and releasing a lot of heat, but I'm not so worried that's gonna happen anytime soon because the activation barrier for that is very high. So if I watch the system on a certain time scale, then I am just basically guaranteed not to have to even worry about nuclear fusion, and everything that happens uh, can ignore a process like the nuclear fusion process that is gonna give you helium. Um, so uh, how I'm looking at a system often depends on you know, how long I'm willing to watch it, and that time scale will determine which processes are slow and which ones are fast, um, and, and that will make a big difference to what can happen. So talking about maxima is very, is very confusing, uh, but I think that what we can say is that we can talk about uh, uh, exceptionality, right? That I can recognize something as exceptional without it being optimal. So if I uh, have a whole chemical space of combinations, and I know what the distribution of some property is for a random place in that space of combinations, uh, 
and I can look at my quantity that I'm looking at, such as the amount of uh, entropy production per reaction that happens uh, in, in the system, and I can tell that I've reached a state which is quite exceptional in that distribution, that I'm in a very non-random place. And I think that's actually part and parcel to how we really recognize function and its relationship to form. Well, we've been talking about life for a while, uh, but we haven't, you didn't once mention the word information. Mm -hmm. Can, what role does information play in life? Because the reason I'm asking is sure. because when I have tried to redefine life as far from equilibrium dissipative systems, I always have a problem. Metabolism seems to be okay, but mm -hmm. information does not seem to be contained in a tornado or a convection cell. But mm -hmm. there seems to be a metabolism going, a free energy extraction, entropy mm -hmm. production, and reducing the, the gradient, mm -hmm. but no information or very little information. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a really interesting question and one that we're... Uh, quite engaged in, in, in trying to uh, sort through. Uh, but I think the things that we're trying to do with that are still at pretty early, early days. Um, I think the short answer is that one of the things you have to be very careful about when talking about information is that it is uh, described differently, or you know, the word is used differently in different contexts. So there's a narrow mathematical sense of information in the context of information theory, which is about sending signals through noisy channels. And it's been found that information theory is useful for understanding the physical structure of, of certain aspects of living things and how they work. And so, you know, particular people do research and, and quite interesting research on this. Uh, so sometimes there's a part of a biological system that looks like a signal processing problem and then information theory can help you understand the structure of the biological system. More generally though, when we talk about semantic information, yeah, we, we, we have all these other semantic connotations that are associated with it and, you know, I'm giving you information by telling you I was born in Boston, right? But it's very hard to formalize that information in information theoretic terms. Um, uh, and moreover, I think when we're talking about living things, we have all of this uh, sense that, of course, there's a lot of information processing going on and living things make use of a lot of information they sense about their environment. Uh, but it, all the different things that happen to them, filtering out which parts are the transduction of information, which parts aren't, is very difficult. And I think the reason for this... Excuse me, sorry. the transduction of information from where to where? So what I mean is that uh, it, the, 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 the uh, very clean, clear example to us of information is uh, of information flowing in a way that carries all the right semantic connotations is, I don't know, a animal uh, wakes up, looks around, sees the sun, uh, knows it's daytime, uh, reacts to all of that in ways that, you know, it, it executes behaviors that are typical for the animal during the daytime. Mm -hmm. So we, we think that there's some information that it got from observing its surroundings. But, that, but that's neural information. How about the information right. to reading DNA and turning it into a protein? Right, right, right. And so then, you know, another kind of uh, place we're tempted to talk about information is with uh, genomes, although there I think we already have to start to be very careful because the genetic code actually is a model that we've made for predicting the behavior of molecules, right? The, the DNA doesn't, so to speak, know its information. The DNA is, uh, we think of it as being a molecule that has a regular structure to wait, it. Wait, excuse me, and then, you just said the DNA does not know it is information. Yeah, I'm just saying people, as a self people have a, a tendency <laughs> to engage in, I think, you know, very loose talk about DNA as though uh, it is computing things and it is commanding things and directing things. DNA is a molecule that we can isolate. It has a regular structure to it that we can demonstrate. And we have recognized that there is a code uh, for how DNA gets, for example, uh, transcribed and translated into protein in the typical case in the cell, where it gives us predictive power over, you know, if I put in this DNA, what protein am I going to get out? Uh, but when we talk about it uh, as information, I think it's very important uh, to remember that we're the ones who are being informed. We're right? the that, reader? Uh, what's that? We're the reader? Yeah, we're the, we're the ones who, who view it as information. And I think when we, when we start talking about DNA as though it is itself uh, information uh, in a sort of self-contained context within the cell, uh, we just have to be careful to remember that we're actually the ones that are making these attributions. I can always talk about it in information theoretic terms and say it's a sequence it has, you know, four different states at each position, and so it's a code, you know, once I, once I describe it that way, I can use Shannon information, but 
Uh, then what I'm limited to is the definition of Shannon information uh, has, a, has a particular quantitative form, and DNA may actually contain more semantic information yes. than just the, what the code contains in, in terms of you know, Shannon information. So I, information is a really fraught subject because there's all of this slippage in, in the way that people use, are using the word. But I think what's really important is this. You know, um, if we're going to think about why it is that living things are behaving in ways that look to us like they're you know, making use of information in, in useful ways, um, then I, I think the interesting thing to think about is the relationship between any given system, some non-equilibrium system, and its environment. Yeah. That when we were talking about far from equilibrium, you have some spiral worlds, you know, it looks maybe like, as you say, maybe a hurricane looks like it's in a sense extracting energy from an out of equilibrium drive, but we don't think necessarily in informational terms. Uh, but I think that uh, the place that we might want to start looking for that in non-equilibrium systems is in cases where we have a, a clean kind of experimental or simulated example where we can keep track really well of what is predictable about the environment. Because the issue there is that there are feedback processes in a variety of non-equilibrium systems that grow the rate of energy absorption over time or that grow the sort of uh, forcing on the system. In other words, the sort of amount of energy harvested per unit, some chemical reactive flux. There are systems that, you know, behave that way and they aren't ones that you just find, you know, walking around, um, uh, picking them up off the ground, but you can create experimental systems that seem to act this way. So now if you, if you, if you create a system that, you know, has a lot of components that it has some tendency through feedback to try to grow the, the rate of energy absorption over time, you can imagine presenting different kinds of challenges to such a system. Uh, and um, one simple challenge is just to say, for example, I'll drive it with a, a certain oscillatory frequency. So you know, we have a, a system that we work with that, that works this way. Um, it's a bunch of uh, masses and springs that are changing the way the springs are hooked together and bouncing around according to physical rules. And then you wiggle one of the particles at a certain frequency, some of the springs form, some of them break, and then you get these new structures. So the, the point is though that the particular frequency that I choose uh, is something about the environment that presents it with a kind of a challenge. Uh, because if I'm in the right shape, then I resonate, I absorb a lot of energy, and if I'm in the wrong shape, I don't. So that's a system where we, what we can see right now is you can make things that resonate with a fixed frequency. But you could imagine a more complicated challenge, right? You could imagine an environment, for example, that is very hard to absorb energy from unless you are actually making accurate predictions of your future. So in principle, the environment could be somewhat predictable, but in ways that are challenging, so that only if you figure out the right model of your environment, mm -hmm. then can you take your past and use it as a way of predicting your future, right? But, but I want to get back to this question that we started with, and that is, um, how should we expect life elsewhere based on your research into what life is and how mm -hmm. life acts? Is, is, is your studies leading to, or your research leading to increase the probability that there will be life on a planet around Alpha Zen B or decreasing them, or is it still agnostic and you can't say anything? Aren't you, are, aren't you making progress toward trying to answer the question, should we expect life elsewhere? I, in narrow terms, think what I can say about our research is that it's focused on the question of what are the physical conditions that are required or conducive for the emergence of different kinds of life-like behaviors from settings in which they're initially absent. And I think the more so that we refine our understanding of those aspects into physics, the more when we pose a question about what there is out there in the rest of the universe, we will have more to put in the blank space of, of, of what we're you know, trying to fill with our imagination. Because I think that you know, when we try to make these calculations about what's out there, there always are these X factors we don't know. But sometimes, in addition, there are some somewhat naive kind of gut feelings that we have about the difficulty of producing certain kinds of behavior. So for example, you know, if I find a pine cone on the ground, I don't wonder where, how it got to the ground given that it was initially on a tree because I know that there's gravity and sometimes things fall. And so there's a tendency from the physics 
to end up on the ground you know, if you break off a tree. Uh, and, and so we, we've refined our understanding of physics further because in the 19th and 20th century, what we figured out is the formation of crystals, which might have initially seemed really challenging and, and, and difficult because you're ordering in this incredibly intricate way a lot of different atoms in this regular lattice, that turns out to, in another sense, also be like a ball rolling down a hill. Right, but right? Let, me get, let me interrupt you. Uh, it seems that if you're taking a physics approach to mm -hmm. the origin of life, the physics is the same all over the universe. Right. And so is pretty much the chemistry, as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then your answer will have to come out, yes, life is everywhere. Well, I think it, it may come out that uh, there are probably a lot of places that exhibit some behaviors that we think of as being the uh, behavioral building blocks of life. If, if we talk about a living thing, you know, the paragon of life, you know, the, 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 take a random member of the animal kingdom, we're not just talking about predictive computation. And we're not just talking about energy harvesting. We're not just talking about self-replication. We're talking about that and a whole lot more, you know, the modularity, you know, there are all these different things we can point to in living things that we, we might add to the list of things that are very distinctive of them, and any given living thing is all of those things at once rolled up into a coherent whole uh, that is generally quite marvelous. And I should not presume where I'm sitting uh, about how easy it is to get all of those things to uh, come together. And, and so there's still going to always be this X factor of it. Just because you can tell me, all right, there's a whole bunch of matter over there very far from thermal equilibrium, lots of detailed balance breaking flows. There's a challenging environment where certain states you know, are rare that are much better at absorbing the energy. You know, all of that, I might be able to say, okay, so maybe you'll get something that kind of looks like a metabolism, like or a rough cut of a metabolism. Maybe you'll get very primitive self-replicators there. And those are the kinds of questions that we're focused on. But then you just turn on Darwinian evolution and then all of a sudden you get fine tuning. Yeah, so, very, so, very good one. so I, I mean, it is, uh, it is reasonable to me to suppose that if some of the things we think of as being uh, the necessary early building blocks for cellular life uh, can, can form out of relatively naive molecular herd behavior in the far from equilibrium regime, and if it's the case that self-replicators also can form spontaneously under relatively generic conditions, and we've been doing some work on that as well, uh, that certainly resets our sense of how difficult it is to get all of this going. Uh, and resets it from where to where. It, 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 I, I think it opens the field to you know it, it being a lot easier than our you know naive intuitions might have suggested, or at least mine might have suggested when I was younger and less educated. Um, uh, but uh, that I think doesn't carry us all the way forward to calculating a probability of something because uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's all a question of where we're drawing the line. So it, it, then it does get back to this question you're asking before about, you know, are viruses alive? Because um, if, I get, if I'm willing to be expansive enough in my definition of what life is, I might ultimately be kind of disappointed by some of the members of that group in terms of how interesting there are. I'm not saying viruses aren't interesting, but there could be something even more primitive somehow than viruses um, that, I, that might end up falling into some big tent I try to create. And then maybe if I make that tent big enough, I could say with confidence, yeah, there's probably some stuff like that going on somewhere, you know, as long as I have this amount of chemical diversity and this, you know, strength of non-equilibrium driving. But then that's not as exciting as, you know, what people I think really are excited about is, you know, two-headed three well, lung right, giraffes right, right, right. that are, you know, but, on but another a, planet. But as a scientist, don't you have a naturalistic view of, hey, on Earth there wasn't life, and then non-life did blah, 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 and turned into life. We have a naturalistic transition, the later part of which is governed by, by Darwinian evolution, but the mm -hmm. beginning has to be governed by the type of things that you're researching and redox gradients. Mm -hmm. it, now, on the other hand, some people uh, are religious and say, oh, no, well, we don't know how that's done, and then God did it. Mm -hmm. now, I actually am also religious, but you so know, how, I, I, so wouldn't, you, I wouldn't put things uh, you know, how do you, precisely the way that you How do you have, deal with that? With that well, uh, like as a scientist, I'm not very religious, so I say, sure. hey, it, it, there's a naturalistic transition that we should be able to explain with chemistry and physics, and there's no role for any gods. Mm -hmm. But do you have a role for gods in this evolution? Well, I, I mean, I think 
my own understanding is, is certainly specifically filtered through um, the you know, texts of the Jewish tradition, so the Hebrew Bible and, and the uh, writings and sayings of the Talmudic sages, etc. cetera. Uh, and viewed through that lens, I don't see such a tension because I think that uh, there's really uh, a lot of room to resolve these issues by viewing it in terms of, again, the language that we're currently speaking in the way that we talk about things. So uh, the, the, there uh, is a language for talking about the world in which what we're oriented towards is questions like, how should I act? Or uh, what meaning should I see in the events that occur in my life? Or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that is the goal, let's say, of the Hebrew Bible, to uh, provide a taxonomy and a, and a narrative and a legal system for uh, what the world is uh, with the goal of enabling uh, the Israelite nation to have some way of arguing with each other about no, what they should any, be doing. Does that right? have anything to do with the origin of life? Well, it obviously... Uh, it does have to do with you know, the text concerns itself uh, with the origin of life, but again, it's a different kind of origin that it's talking about. It's not talking about an origin in the language of physics or in the language of biology. It's talking about uh, it in in terms that are relevant to the mission, right? And the the mission that uh, this document concerns itself with has to do with uh, social order and, and national identity and all of these things, which. You know, they, the vocabulary you need for that is birds and men and women and fish and light right, and dark right, and all right, those things. Right. You, you don't need DNA and electrons first uh -huh. in order to deal with those issues, right? So I, I think that um, I don't see any uh, conflict there, both in terms of, I, I don't think that the, the texts of, of that tradition or of the tradition that I'm a part of um, are seeking to replace or supplant or exclude scientific reasoning as a, as a way of knowing things about the world. Um, but I, I think that it just understands, in my view correctly, that there's a broader set of questions that we're trying to talk about. Well, I thought one of the questions was, uh, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then there was life or something. As mm -hmm. if I, I thought it was a, definitely a pr prediction of the, this tradition that God created life. Right, but, you know, it's interesting that well, so first of all, I, I think the simple thing is that uh, we always assume when we, when we talk about this that we know how the word uh, God functions in that sense and, and what it means. When in fact, uh, I, arguably, the whole point of uh, engagement with the text uh, is to gradually have a deepening understanding of what that word means which should not at all be taken to be obvious and which has to be inferred from its context of usage. So it could be physics. So, so you know, <laughs> it I, could include physics. Well, right? and, and, and there's certainly, you know, a lot of recognition of uh, the, the role of God as a setter of natural laws that, you know, comes out in various verses, right? But, so there are just other things right. as well. Now, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to, tr to, uh, to increase the sensitivity of radio telescopes to try mm -hmm. to detect uh, intelligent extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. Now, if I gave you, I don't know, $100 billion with mm -hmm. the caveat, you have to spend this money to try to answer the question, are we alone? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Hmm. Uh, Remember the caveat. It, it has to be, it has to help answer the question, are we alone? Uh, so... I'm going to assume that we're talking about some kind of uh, scientific project, yeah. and well, do you have uh, another non-scientific? Well, I'm project? saying that you know, a hundred billion dollars. Uh, if you didn't stipulate that it had to be for a scientific project, then well, I, I, I've I, never I, thought of it. I might, <laughs> I might end up feeling compelled to use it for other things. But wait, you wait, know, wait, no, I'm curious because so, I, as a scientist, I didn't even think there was an alternative. But what is the alternative that you were thinking of that's non-scientific? Well. Um, uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of, so if we keep coming back to the question, are we alone? Um, there is a, an existential aspect to that question, right? Where, where, where people, they, they're fascinated by that question uh, for a reason that I think is not 
a, a matter of scientific curiosity on par with the question of you know, why vinegar and baking right. soda make bubbles. But that's when I, the I, word we means right. we human beings. Right. But if we do it more scientifically, and let's say we're talking about life on Earth, right. and life as we've been talking mm -hmm. about, then it's a purely scientific question? Well, um, I, I think our curiosity about it is still, in a sense, driven by our experience of the world as, you know, we're riding behind this set of eyes, and we, uh, if you go way down to the bottom in terms of real philosophical epistemic skepticism, the first question is, you know, am I alone, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, are, are, are there, is there anything other than my own experience? You're right? not a solipsist, are you? Uh, I, I'm not myself a solipsist, but I'm saying that um, <laughs> but solipsism... But I have a group of solipsists. <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is worth recognizing that in order to do science, we have to assume solipsism away, right? That okay, it, it, right. It's, it's, a, it's sort of Right. An axiom of, of our method. All right, you student of Wittgenstein then. <laughs> so I'm going to be, give you $100 billion. What are you going to do with it to try to answer the question, are we alone? All right, so I, I, I'll construe that to mean, um, you know, uh, how would we try to tell whether there was life outside of our solar system, let's say. Okay. Um, and, you know, possibly, let's say, uh, intelligent life. And, you know, I, I may have a very boring answer to this, which is... Um, uh, I think that uh, there isn't really a substitute for uh, direct experience and interaction. Uh, and if we want to uh, make real substantive contact with something, then we have to be there. Um, and so I would, I would focus that effort on uh, seeing how far we can get. And, and that may ultimately disappoint us and frustrate us because you know, right now the odds don't look good. We can always discover new physics. We can always realize some things are different than we thought. You know, people are now talking now, I guess, about, you know, the, is there a planet closer to us than, you know, we had, had previously thought? I, don't know, I thought I heard something in the news in the last year. I don't follow that stuff very well. But um, I, I, I think that um, trying to augur intelligence from the noise we get from space, to me, seems quite dangerous uh, in terms of uh, how much of it is going to be about our own uh, desire to find that partner for, uh, and, and how willing we will therefore be to sort of turn the knobs on the Turing test until it works. Well, that's my next question is, what kind of aliens would you like to find? I like to talk to the emotional side of you rather than the, re the uh, rational sure. side. So close your eyes. Get in touch with your inner emotions. Put your reason aside and answer the question: What kind of aliens would you like to meet? Uh, I would, uh, I guess, love to meet aliens who uh, have uh, the ability to uh, exchange language in a meaningful way that uh, could ultimately. Uh, expand the community of people who are able to discuss things like, you know, where did the world come from and, and what should we be doing in it? Um, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's also nice if, if all we find is three-headed or two-lunged giraffes or, or sorry, two-headed, three-lunged giraffes or whatever, then that would be interesting, but, you know, maybe a little bit less uh, exciting than the, the real possibility of ex expanding the community of, of beings created in the image of God. So you're looking for God then? Well, I, I think You'd that like to meet God. If, if, if we're you know, talking about you know, my, my own personal uh, uh, convictions, then I have to acknowledge that I'm interested in many scientific questions and I, I understand how to pursue them as a scientist, but I'm interested in other questions as well. And uh, if, if I were going to express a preference about, you know, who it would be nice to meet, um, then uh, it's, it's, it's not only a scientific question to me. So an om you'd like to meet an omniscient being who would put no. you out of a job. Well, so I'm not, I, I didn't say, you know, uh, <coughs> you know, having an encounter with God is a different thing than, than an encounter with aliens who can talk about it. I'm just saying, you know. Is it? I mean, well, we why? have predictions based on uh, the lifetimes of planets that our Earth uh, most Earth, or the average Earth, is about two billion years older than ours. Mm -hmm. And if there's, if you have life, and then you have intelligent life, and mm -hmm. you have two billion more years to evolve than we have had, mm -hmm. that seems pretty uh, godlike. As a matter of fact, 
Carl Sagan, not Carl Sagan, but uh, Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. But then a guy, Carl Schroeder, says, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Mm -hmm. And the idea there being is that when you become technologically advanced, you don't build uh, parking lots and big buildings. You become somehow more sustainable and ecologically friendly and more mm -hmm. indistinguishable from, uh, I guess, a rainforest or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, is a fascinating tension <laughs> to consider, but not one where I, I, I okay. necessarily can okay. lay a marker. In okay, that is, are we alone in an important question? Mm -hmm. um, so, I think that there are important questions that feed into it. Uh, I, 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 assigning importance, again, we have to decide, you know, what hat we're wearing. Um, obviously, if we're talking about uh, all the concerns of humanity, then, you know, that, that's a broader discussion. If we're talking about should scientists be interested in something, then you have to decide, you know, is that for aesthetic reasons that we decide what's interesting? Is it for technological or, you know, medical reasons? Or why, why, why do we ask these questions? And if it's just, a, you know, our, a matter of our own curiosity, um, I think that that then does come back to this issue. You know, people want to know because they, uh, there's a, uh, an existential yearning to understand why we're here, which uh, I think in modern times the idea of aliens, you know, taps into and, and, and connects to. Um, so if, if, if the question of what, are we alone is a broad enough one, if, if what it really pertains to is the question of and, and, and really a partly psychological and ideological question of what it is that we mean when we, uh, for example, seek other intelligences. What are we really looking for there? What, is our, what are our criteria? What, uh, what counts and what doesn't count? And if that provokes us to recognize that really um, a lot of this is, is up to our own judgment of where we're willing to look, uh, and uh, what we're willing to consider as sort of a partner uh, in, in dialogue, then um, I think that that you know, could lead to a certain kind of progress. Because I think right now people kind of tend to think that it's, it's, it's naturally and scientifically uh, the case that, for example, I'm a conscious being and you're a conscious being and we can talk to each other, uh, but uh, there aren't other things I, you know, I can't have a conversation with the wind or with the ocean. But I think, in fact, human beings have very plastic uh, sort of tendencies in their own psychology to seek and create the sense of dialogue with anything that is complex and partly predictable. Uh, and I think if you look at ancient uh, paganism, I think it was really about trying to sort of stoke that sense that you're in dialogue with things other than you know, people uh, that are, are in your surroundings. And the choice not to do that, I think is actually an ideological one. And one to which I'm myself committed, but I, I don't think that that should be viewed as being uh, something that is proven in a sense to us naturally uh, from uh, first principles. There are a lot of, you know, it's like I was talking before about epistemic solipsism. We make a lot of assumptions before go when we start reasoning as scientists. Um, and I think it's worthwhile for us to recognize uh, that we're making those assumptions because I think that kind of philosophical clarity probably will not only lead to better science, but also perhaps um, better communication between people about a whole lot of things. Huh, so world peace. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, uh, so what do you think are this, about this question, are we alone, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that students might have? Um, this is a course about are we alone? Students are trying to learn about it. They're trying to understand the details yeah, and the no, science of it. I think what that's are the misconceptions? That's an interesting question. I think that probably one of the most significant issues or, or difficulties is um, people's understanding of probability and what it means for something to be random. Because uh, when we engage in arguments about you know, where life came from and how it got so complicated and everything, there's always this question of, 
uh, probability and the, the, and especially when we're talking about origins of life, the likelihood of the emergence of something. Yes. And I think the thing that people um, sometimes fall into the trap of is thinking that probability is uh, a, a sort of an intrinsic property uh, as, a, as opposed to a way that we model our own ignorance, right? So um, I have uh, a guess, let's say, about, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's the likelihood of, of something happening. Uh, you know, sometimes when people uh, talk, especially if we're talking about, say, undergraduate students, the way they maybe first learn probability is it's a game. It, it's been described to them as a game. And, you know, there were games of chance that really drove the first development of the theory of probability. So, you know, you think of it as, all right, I have a system, a set of outcomes, um, and I'm going to press the button, and one of them is going to be randomly selected with a certain bias, um, and, and, and that's um, uh, now going to be uh, the way I get my result. And so I look at the stars, and each one of them is an independent random button that's getting pressed, and as long as I have you know, a good model, uh, I have the right probabilistic model of, of that random number generator, then this one's going to be you know, have life, this one's going to have life, and it'll be intelligent, and it's just a matter of you know, uh, rolling the dice. I think, in fact, the way probability works is it's a modeling framework that we develop in order to deal with the fact that there are things that are predictable about the world uh, that are not 100% reproducible, but nonetheless that we can predict the sort of the spread of possibilities. Well, I'm sorry, um, what's, the, what's the distinction between those two? You put them as if they're, it sounds like the same thing to me. So what I mean is, so uh, the issue is that in order for me to assign the probability to anything, it's not a number that's true about the system. It's a number that I attribute to the system once I decide on my model of the space of possibilities. And the reason it's important to recognize that is because my model of the space of possibilities could be quite naive or limited. Uh, and certainly, if my knowledge of that space is woefully incomplete, then I should probably avoid trying to compute or estimate probabilities. So, you know, if I'm trying to for example, calculate the likelihood of there being life on another planet, I can um, uh, start by uh, specifying, or I should start by specifying the different outcomes uh, that I am assigning probabilities to so that I can you know, make my choice among them. Mm -hmm. But how do you even begin to you know, make that calculation? Because we're, we're talking about systems that, by their very definition, have so much combinatorial diversity in the ways that you can put stuff together uh, and, and so uh, much that we don't necessarily know about uh, their dynamics and how they make transitions between those different states of configuration that all I want is for people to acknowledge that probability uh, is uh, something that we bring to the table as a sort of a crutch or a modeling tool to get a handle on our own imperfect ability to predict. So, so let me get this straight. Let me try to paraphrase you. Charlie says, are we alone? And you say, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Is that what you just said? I, I think because right, right now... Because uh, it's so hard to predict what the probabilities are and we're... No, I, I, I think that the, the, the way I would put it is more that... Um, what we know empirically about the world always informs the best model that we can make for uh, anything that we're trying to predict. Okay, and the best model but I that think you that have the best for the models that we life. can make for what might be possible if we're talking about the whole rest of the universe uh, are probably pretty limited with respect to this question because you know we only have the ability to observe the rest of the universe on. You know, scales that are quite uh, disjoined from the scales on which we actually think the action is happening. Well, if the action has happened here on Earth, mm -hmm. and, and you're dealing with it from a pure physics or chemistry point of view, then that would I would assume that if you can explain the origin of life based on that, then you're explaining it everywhere in the universe. Yeah, but nothing special I mean, so, about so then I. I I guess all I'm saying is, you know, there are all these different kind of Bayesian arguments that you can make based on what your sort of prior is. So, um, I, I, you obviously could say uh, the likelihood of our being here, if life is so unlikely, uh, 
is um, uh, so small that then we shouldn't be here, but how therefore a, that means we probably how about a are seven? likely to be here, but then you get all sort of scrambled up in these anthropic arguments, right, where yeah. we are here. Yeah. So the fact that we are here is like a big prior on everything else that we see or any, yes. and are able to observe. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, models of what the universe could have been or what the rest of the universe is like uh -huh. um, beyond what we're able to observe, uh -huh. there always is you know, a question of, how much you want to give weight to how things look from where we're sitting, right? So, you know, people try to make these cosmological models, for example, where it's sort of about, you know, different versions of the laws of physics that could have been generated by uh -huh. some meta process. Uh -huh. um, and I always find those kinds of arguments to be uh, of limited uh, traction in, in addressing any of these issues, because of course, I can make up a variety of different processes for drawing laws of physics out of a right, hat, right. And depending I, I, on the I share process. your skepticism, but I don't share the same, we don't have the same skepticism when it comes to Earth-like planets with water with redox gradients on them. Everything mm -hmm. we know about the rest of the universe now tells us that there will be Earth-like planets very, very similar to Earth in any sense in terms of the physics and chemistry mm -hmm. all over the universe. Now, maybe that's all you need to, per to answer the question, are we alone? If you can say, well, you know, we have these redox gradients and they will make this, this, and this, and then therefore you get biological all emissions. Right. So let me, let me try to formulate the issue uh, better. Suppose that we, we did have a very good model of how all this works. And suppose that we did... Uh, Wait, by all this, you mean, yeah, sorry, how, I mean life I, gets yeah, started. How, how, how life that turns into things with ten fingers or whatever um, oh, no, uh, gets ten going. Bacteria. Yeah, forget, forget about, about the eukaryotes. Forget about the eukaryotes. How, 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 how you get prokaryotic life, you know, suppose that we, we have a really good understanding of the necessary ingredients for that and exactly how um, uh, constrained our system needs to be before that outcome is likely on a certain time scale. And suppose that what we found was when we calculated that probability, that it would be roughly one planet in a whole galaxy or in a whole galactic cluster uh, that had that property. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be that that would be implausible because we could be that planet, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, then I think, but, but once you're operating at that level, when you're trying to calculate things that are that unlikely, mm -hmm you're probably wrong by orders of magnitude one way or another without the ability to measure or test that difference. Well, could it be a set of measure zero? Um, I, I mean, I think once we get to that point, I, I, I retreat to my uh, philosophic or epistemic hidey hole and say, you know, wake me up when um, aliens land or something like that. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we have is the, the world where we are, right? And, and we have observational capabilities and we have uh, transportational capabilities. And at this current moment, this is what the world is. And, and this is mostly what we have to deal with. So we can look at the sky uh, and we can listen for things, so to speak. Um, and, and we can travel around here. We even have like limited ability to you know, go to the bottom of the sea, let alone uh, to uh, much greater distances than the moon. Um, and, and I think that if we're talking about set of measure zero, I don't like talking about numbers where there's no chance that anyone could uh, perform the measurement or falsify it. I don't. I don't wait, 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 wait a minute. So, oh, so what I'm saying people is, all over the world who are trying to, for example, lots of laboratories. Jack Sostak here is mm -hmm. trying to make artificial life, life mm -hmm. in the lab, and you're trying to model the origin of life. Couldn't it very well be a scientific result that you can't do it? You can't do it. We've tried for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to produce the origin of life, and we say, no, you can't do it. Couldn't that be a set of measure zero? Um, for example, now you you are a person, mm -hmm. and I can ask the question as a cosmologist, how, if, if you're not a set of measure zero, I can yeah. ask the question, how far, far into the universe do I have to go before I find the next you? Mm -hmm. Your probability is epsilon, I could just, okay, I just have, I just multiplied by one over, one over epsilon number of stars in there, yeah. I get you. As a matter of fact, your colleague Max Tegmark has done that calculation. How far mm -hmm. do you go to before he gets the next? Now, one, uh, now, so if you don't believe there's another Jeremy England out there, you'd have to say you're a set of measure zero. Mm -hmm. And then you can solve that issue. Say, well, I'm the only Jeremy England in the whole universe, speaking English. Well, so, 
Now that seems to me a, a same sounds like a logical, reasonable solution that doesn't make you go want to go to sleep and then say, "Tell so, me when the aliens arrive." <laughs> so clearly, you know, there are modeling exercises that you can carry out where they they proceed from start to finish along these lines. So you can say, "I will assume the following about the universe," uh -huh. and if I do so, then I I calculate the following. But uh, I, I just think. When, whenever we're engaging in this kind of modeling, we will make certain assumptions. Uh, a whole raft full of them will be laughably untestable. Uh, and then someone else will say, oh, I would make this different assumption. Uh, and, and that might be a reasonable one to make too. Right. So you know, if, if I'm limited to what I can say from the things that we actually can manipulate and you know, visit and test empirically, uh, then I just I don't see the number of me's there are in the universe as a number that really is very much worth talking about right now. This is again the sort of Wittgensteinian, you know, in me coming out. And really, I think also to be frank, I, you know, Wittgensteinian philosophy is in some ways a sort of 20th century redux of a lot of the epistemology of the Hebrew Bible, if you look at it a certain way. So I, I uh -huh. it's not accidental. Okay. Um, so advice for students who want to look into this question and want to become, let's say, astrobiologist. Um, I think that, uh, to me, the thing that perhaps, you know, I hope will increasingly be part of the discussion in all of this, uh, and which we're really working away at right now, and which I think hopefully is an interesting idea for people to start carrying around with them as they try to address these issues, um, is, is to think about when you're trying to understand, uh, a, a, a living thing, or even not a living thing, but a physical system, uh, rather than relying on sort of gut intuitions for what something is capable of when it's randomly slapped together, remember that the typical case is rather that something, uh, any material system, is a collection of matter that has a history, and that it has a history that bears the mark of the environment in which it has dynamically evolved over time. Uh, and once you recognize that, there is the possibility, not always the guarantee, but the possibility that where you are likely to end up and stay could contain a lot of information about the particularities of that environment. And what that means is needles in a haystack that seem to us to be very unlikely outcomes, uh, they may be just unlikely because we uh, have very misguided in intuition. Uh, and like, like I was talking about before, we eventually have understood, for example, that a crystal, even though it's very orderly, we can think of as a ball rolling down a hill if we model it in terms of its physical properties in certain ways. The question is, what is the generalization of that idea where we can still talk in thermodynamic terms and say, this is actually like a ball rolling down a hill. You, you wander around and you get stuck in this shape that looks very special because of its relationship to its environment, but actually that's something that we should be able to see all over the place in a variety of contexts if we look for it in the right way. I think that that idea, thinking about the, the, the generalization of evolution to talking about the properties of sort of materials or more general collections of matter, where we're thinking about not the parents or the grandparents, but about the antecedent structures that it passed through and what physical forces were biasing that exploration of the space of possible configurations. That idea, I hope, will be one that carries into a lot of different um, uh, ways of, of thinking about these issues as time goes on. Uh, and and um, to me, at least, it's, it's been a very powerful uh, new intuition to provide to, to thinking about uh, some of these questions. OK, and are we the life forms on Earth alone in the universe? Sorry, I, I'll have to ask you to so ask the question again one more time. I so. want a short answer. Mm -hmm. Are we the life forms on Earth alone in the universe? No. And why do you say that? Because I think that the sense of aloneness uh, that is being referenced there uh, is ultimately so much bound up in our definition of, of what we would, uh, what would count as an encounter uh, that I think uh, we have the opportunity to not be alone uh, if we seek it in the right way.
But um, I, I think if we're saying alone, and what we mean is a heart, two lungs, and a brain like ours, and DNA, maybe. Maybe we're alone in that respect. OK, oh, is the, cold, the bacteria on Earth alone? Are there other bacteria in the universe? Again, um, you know, guanosine, adenosine, maybe. Maybe, maybe they're alone.